Today we're going to do a really quick high level overview on database indexing. And so this is going to include talking about uh, what is an index? What problem does an index actually solve? What are the most common indexes and when should you use them? Uh, now, as I said, it'll be high level and for much more detail, please head over to the Hello Interview website and we have a deep dive on database indexing. I'll be sure to link that in the description. Let's get after it. All right, so before we start talking about indexing, let's understand the problem that indexing solves. So data is arranged in a database in pages. Pages are usually eight kilobytes of data. And so when you wanna find a particular item in your database and you're not using indexing, what happens is that we pull a page into RAM, into memory, we scan through all roughly a hundred rows or items looking for the item that we're after. And if we don't find it, we put that page back, pull in the next one, put that one back, pull in the next one until we eventually find it. And so as you're starting to realize this is a slow process. To illustrate this, if we had a hundred million users in our user table, and each page, as I said, has maybe about a hundred rows, then that's a million of these pages. Now, each round trip from SSD to RAM is about a hundred microseconds. And so that's a hundred seconds in the worst case for us to find the item that we're looking for. Now it's worth noting that in reality, there's prefetching and there's other database optimizations that would probably actually get this down closer to three to five seconds. But the point stands, this is far longer than a user wants to wait in order to get a query for some data for a given input ID. So how do indexes solve this problem for us? Well, indexes are just data structures that are stored on disk and act as a map to tell us where items or on which page items exist in the database. And so when a new query comes in for a particular item, we first pull that index into memory, check which page that index tells us the resource or the item lives on, and then we pull only that particular page. In this case, maybe it was page one. And so as opposed to reading up to a million pages, as was the case with our sequential or our table scan, now we use the index to just tell us exactly which page we should look at. So now naturally the question becomes, well, what types of indexes are there and when should I use them? Let's start by first explaining what is by far the most popular database index, which is the B-tree. And so B-trees are just basic tree structures, just like what you've learned in data structures and algorithms, where each node in the tree is a sorted list of values with pointers to another page in disk, either a child node, as the case here, or an actual data page, like here. And so let's illustrate this with an example. I think it'll make much more sense. So let's say that we had a query like this, where we wanna select all users where their age is exactly 51. And in our user table, to do this, we built an index on age. And so this is the index on age. These are all the different ages of our users in our users table. And so the first thing that we would do is we would pull in our root node into memory. So if we go back up to our example up here, that root node itself, each one of these blue boxes is a page on disk. And so we'd bring that guy into memory. We would look at it and we'd say, we want 51. So that's greater than 50, less than 90. So we're gonna pull in this page next. That would pull in a different index page. And then we'd go in here and look at it and say, well, 51 is less than 55. And so which page does that correspond to? It corresponds to page three. And so we'd come up here and we'd pull page three into memory. And that's where all of the users that are age 51 exist. Now, what if we were to do something like this and we would change this from an, uh, a direct value lookup to a range query? Well, in this case, we're gonna pull in our index, look at our root, and we're gonna pull in both of these blocks into memory this time this one and this one, because they're both greater than 50. And now we're gonna follow the pointers in each of these, so all seven of them, and we're gonna load all seven of those pages into memory because that's all of our users who are greater than 51. The next index worth discussing is called a hash index. And so a hash index is really straightforward. It's just a hash map, so again, that exists in disk. And if you're looking for, for example, a user with a given email, you're gonna pass that email into a hash function, and then you're gonna have some hash map that maps that key, that hashed email, to a value where the value is just a pointer of where that data exists on disk. And so for example, in this case, the data for John, his full row exists on page four. And so we're gonna pull that into memory. Now, in reality, and this is important, hash indexes are rarely actually used in production databases. So while they offer O of one lookups, which is great, um, B trees perform nearly just as well for exact matches, but they also support those range queries and sorting that we were looking at just a moment ago. And so the only places you'll commonly see these hash indexes are for in-memory stores, things like Redisk, where disk IO patterns aren't really that relevant. So it's good to know from a historical context perspective, it's useful for caching and other things, 
but typically in an actual database, you're gonna opt for a B tree, not a hash index. Okay, so we get it. B trees rock and they are great for the majority of use cases. But where instances, especially in a system design interview, where you wouldn't wanna use a B tree? Well, the first place is anytime that you have geospatial data. Specifically, if you're trying to search within regions on latitude and longitude. So think of a system design interview like Design Yell or Find My Nearby Friends or something. You want everybody within a given radius of something. And so let's talk about why B trees don't work really well in this case. So if I had a query that was something like this, I want all of the locations that have a latitude greater than 100, less than 400, and a longitude greater than 20, less than 200. So B trees really excel at one dimensional data, but not two dimensional data like this. And the reason is really easy to illustrate. And so if we look at this diagram here, that query would give us all of this data for latitude, all of this data for longitude. And then we're gonna load both of those things into memory and then do a fairly expensive merge until we get this middle area, which is what we actually care about. And so we still needed to get each of these long strips, pull them into memory and do the merge. Is there a more efficient way to do that? And the answer is yes, there are specialized indexes or sometimes just algorithms before the indexing called geospatial indexing. And the three most popular and the three best to know for system design interviews are one geohashing, two quad trees, and three R trees. And we're gonna really briefly go over each of these. So first up, let's, let's look at geohashing. With geohashing, you take the map of the world, imagine that's what this is, and we split it into four parts. We label the top left zero, then one, then two, then three. Now we can then recursively split each of those cells and do the same thing, such that this one is now two zero, two one, two two, two three. And by continuing to do this, we get increasing levels of precision, such that maybe the New Mexico area is 31, but Albuquerque specifically is 310. Now, the nice thing is once you've converted latitude and longitude into these one dimensional strings here, um, then now all nearby locations share a similar prefix. And so uh, this is Chihuahua, I guess. If we wanna find everything near Chihuahua at this degree of precision, then we just get the geohashes near it. 321, 331, 312, and 332, and they all share similar prefixes. And so what we do is we actually create the geohashes and then just build a B tree on top of the hashes themselves, which allow us to easily do these range queries and these O of one or nearly O of one lookups on precise areas. Um, and that's how geohashing works. Now it's worth noting that I did this as just simple numbers for the illustration. We actually base 32 and code them. And so for example, Los Angeles where I'm at is this, that's the geohash for Los Angeles. Next up is quad trees. It's pretty similar to geohashing in that we split the world recursively, but there are a couple subtle differences. The first is that we map this recursive splitting actually to a tree, not a one dimensional string. And we only need to go deeper in this tree in the places where we have high density. So let me show you what this means. Imagine this was a map of the world and each dot is a location in our database. Say this was Yelp, each dot is a business. And so we split the world into four grids. We thus create a tree where the tree has four children and that points to all of the businesses within that grid. So all of the red businesses, all the green businesses is this node, blue and yellow respectively. Now you'll notice there's a lot of density in the blue cell here. And so with quad trees, you specify a K value which is basically saying that if any cell has greater than K value items, then recursively split. And so that was the case here. We had more than five, so we split it again. And we can come over here and we had another four children, right? One, two, three, four. And then one such children or child still had more than five. So we split it again. And so one, two, three, four, right? And so now when we wanna find a particular business, we just work our way down the tree accordingly. And this is the index similar to the B tree that ends up being stored on disk. Lastly, we have R trees. R trees are derived from quad trees. They're a really similar concept, but instead of just crudely splitting the world into even fours, it's a bit more dynamic. It does some clustering in order to find locations or businesses or whatever it may be in your database that are close to each other. And then each of these kind of larger groupings can even have a little bit of, of overlap. And so it's the same general idea. We work down a tree in order to get increasing precision from M, this larger box, to I, this box, and then finally to all the businesses or locations in F, uh, it's just not the case that we need to be so stringent in splitting exactly in fours. It's a bit more dynamic and obviously fairly complex and not something we're gonna go into detail in this video. What's important to note as we zoom out and look at all three of these strategies 
is that geohashing is very popular today. It exists in things like Redis. It's the default. Um, many production databases rely on geohashing. It's a fantastic option. It's quick. It gets to rely on database indexes that already exist like B trees, and you just have an algorithm on the front end. Quad trees were foundational into the development of geospatial indexes, but are actually not really used in production much nowadays. Instead, their predecessor, R trees, are already used in production. And so like post GIS, the extension that enables geospatial indexing on Postgres, for example, uses R trees. And so the important thing is that in a system design interview, if you get tasked with a situation where you have two dimensional data, specifically on latitude and longitude, then you know that you're going to want to introduce some geospatial index. And you might mention to your interviewer that you understand the difference between each of these uh, and specify the one that you want to go with in that particular situation. Let's look at another place where B trees might not be a good choice for your database index. In this case, we want to select all businesses that have pizza in the name. Now, the reason that a B tree is not great here is because if you remember, B trees were sorted. And so in the case of strings, this means they're sorted lexicographically. And so this would be great if it was a prefix search. If we were looking for things that started with pizza, well, your B tree is awesome. But if we want things that have pizza anywhere in the name, well, we have no choice but to do that dreaded full table scan again. We have to pull in every single page and look at all of them. And so instead, what we should do is we should create something called an inverted index. And so inverted indexes are great anytime that you need to search for text. And so this is how we would do it. You can imagine that we have three documents. Document one, which says B trees are fast and reliable. Document two, hash tables are fast but limited. Doc three, B trees handle range queries well. You get the picture. Now what we can do is we can create a map, a hash map, mapping each of the words that appear or the tokens that appear to all of the documents that they appear in. And so now if this was maybe something like fast, uh, we want to get all of the documents in this example that we have down here that have the word fast in it. Well, this is easy. We're just going to look up fast and then find all the documents that map to fast. And this is going to be up maybe pointers to the pages that these obviously exist in memory or on disk. And we'll pull those into memory and then uh, return those rows. So this is inverted indexes, inverted indexes used in things like Elasticsearch, Postgres, full text search. Anytime you're doing full text search, you want inverted indexes. In your system design interview, if you need to search over something with full text, you'll want to mention uh, that you'll need one of those technologies which supports an inverted index. Okay, so to wrap up, I have a confession to make. It's not likely in your actual interview that you're gonna get deep into the implementation of each of these indexes. Instead, what's most important that you understand where your queries might be inefficient, which columns you should apply indexes to, and then, depending on the case, if there is a special index that needs to be applied. And so this is a useful flowchart that, that you should keep in mind. The first is, do you need efficient data access? Well, if the answer is no, then full table scans. Sure, that's fine. If it's yes, then do you have a lot of rows in your table? If you don't, then you can stick to the full table scan. It's not a lot of work to pull those pages into memory and read from them. But if it's a yes, then you have a simple question, and I'm going to zoom in here. And that's that, what type of data are you querying? If you're querying for text data, then you're going to want an inverted index. Elasticsearch, Lucene, full text search, and Postgres, these all will give you an inverted index. If you're searching for location data, then you need a geospatial index. So Redis with geohashing, PostGIS extension on Postgres, Elasticsearch's implementation, which I think uses a combination of geohash and R-tree. Don't quote me on that. Um, do you need exact matches in memory that are fast? Well, maybe consider a hash index, um, but also be, be wary that maybe a B-tree is still the best option. And then for literally everything else, go with a B-tree. So that wraps up our really quick deep dive into database indexing. We'll do more of these short term form videos. We'll also go back to the long form as well. But let me know in the comments what you think if you have any questions and I'll see you all soon. Good luck with your interviews.